Mary Trump, thank you so much for joining me on the Suburban Women Problem. Hi, Amanda. It's really good to be here with you. We're so glad to have you. All right. So I'm sure the first thing that people want to talk about when they chat with you is your family. A lot of us have an uncle who says awkward things at the holiday dinner table. Uh, so I actually have a father who I haven't spoken to in over a decade, but you have us all beat, I think, because your uncle is Donald Trump. So what was it like growing up in the Trump family? Do I win something? What's interesting is that no matter what's going on in your family when you're growing up, you think it's normal because we don't have any insight into what, what's happening in our friends' houses when we're not around, right? Um, so I can't really point to anything that um, made me feel like something was off or weird or wrong because it's all I knew. It wasn't a really happy place to be with them because they were very, you know, they're not an affectionate family. They're pretty cool um, in that waspy, northeastern waspy way. Uh, and it was obvious as I, as I got older, it became very obvious uh, who was in favor, who was not. The, mis the misogyny was impossible to ignore. Not that that's what I would have called it, of course. Um, but clearly, uh, women were not valued in any way, shape, or form. My dad was the black sheep. Uh, there was literally nothing the man could do to be accepted or approved of by his family. And there, by the same token, there was nothing Donald could do wrong. There was literally nothing redeeming about him. So in retrospect, it's really confusing to me that anybody bought it. Wow. Wait, so when was the last time you talked to your uncle, to Donald Trump? Um, the last time I saw him was in April 2017. My aunt, Marianne, was turning 80, and my aunt, Elizabeth, was turning 75. So they decided to celebrate their birthdays together at the White House, as one does. Um, and at the time, Marianne was the only person in the family I was in touch with. We were actually pretty close. I felt like it was my responsibility to go. I didn't want to, but, um, you know, for her, I would do it. And I can actually say that I had a conversation with Donald. I don't think people really have conversations of substance with him ever because he's not capable of it. But we did have an interesting, <laughs> a couple of interesting exchanges. I didn't actually speak to him until we were entering the uh, dining room in the residence uh, up in the West Wing. And he, he looked at me and he smiled and he pointed at me like the way as he points at people. We've seen that point. <laughs> yes. Um, and he said, I specifically asked for you to be invited. What's funny about that is that it wasn't true, but that, <laughs> I mean, I knew it was a complete lie. He knew it was a complete lie, but that he, in any circumstances, he feels the need to make that play at the beginning to um, make the other person feel indebted somehow. So that was fascinating. And I just laughed at him because <laughs> it was just absurd. Uh, and at the very end of the evening, um, you know, he looked at, it was what, three months, four months into the administration and he already looked really stressed out. And I just said, because I wanted to annoy him. I said, uh, as many of us do. Donald, don't let, <laughs> yes. I said, uh, don't let them get you down. And he gritted his, he clenched his teeth and he said, they won't get me. And so far he's been right. So <laughs> let's turn that sucker around, shall we? Your book, Too Much and Never Enough, was a huge success in part because I think people wanted some kind of explanation for Trump. What is it about him, about Donald Trump, that you think appealed to so many people? I think the important thing in figuring out an answer for that, besides um, my getting my parrot out of the way, to Sebastian, oh, everybody. An African gray parrot. Oh, I have a, a heart for birds. Yes. So I actually had a bird growing up. They're very cute pets. I think they're cuter pets than people think. They are. They're also a lot of work and very messy, but they're very smart. That is also true. I did learn that. You know, it took me a really long time uh, to figure out how to answer this question. And I think it's because I did not under, I couldn't understand what people saw in him. And then I realized that the simplest way to understand this is that the things they see in him that they like are the things that people like us 
revile. They love mm. the fact that he gets away with lying so much. They love the fact that he gets away with the criminality. Um, they love that he says whatever he wants and suffers no consequences. I think the thing they most love, to use the word very loosely, uh, about him is the fact that he is a total failure and yet has been allowed to fail upward spectacularly. Wouldn't that be nice if we could all envision ourselves doing the same to fail and somehow get that promotion? Yeah. It, it's a, oh, it's like, so it's like a fantasy dream world that they're in. Like you can keep failing and just keep working your way up. But I've never seen somebody less worthy, less accomplished, less qualified um, <laughs> fail up, upward to that degree. It's, quite something. What can we do to keep him from being elected again? I, I think it's better right now to focus our energies on people who maybe don't vote because they feel like they've been mm. disenfranchised in one way or another, because so many have been, especially Black Americans. Uh, focus on people who are low information voters because they have to work three jobs to put food on the table. And and it's it's all about getting out the vote and communicating. Uh, I th I think right now because um, we don't have a lot of time left, and that's that's where I think our energy should be focused. Let's talk to our base. Let's talk to the people who really need us to turn out the vote and change the habits that they have in voting and get them engaged. Yeah, I, I exactly, and I I really do wish the uh, Democratic Party um, empowered its base the way. Um, the Republican Party caters to its base. Our base is a diverse coalition of mostly black women and uh, people of color and, uh, you know, who who want everybody's lives to be better and want government to be used for that purpose. And the Republican base is a bunch of white supremacists and misogynists, et cetera. So. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and there are suburban women who, I mean, they're busy of all income levels, of all races. There are a lot of suburban women who I think have been left out of these conversations. So start having the conversations with those suburban women. And now you've, you know, re-engaged or engaged voters who weren't voting before and they're voters who you can talk with. That's a really important point. And we see what happened in Virginia, uh, and which happened because only one side was talking to them. And they were, of course, lying and um spreading misinformation, but nobody was countering it. You know, think about it. Uh, Glenn got, Youngkin got through that campaign without anybody, including anybody in the media and anybody in the Democratic campaign calling him a racist, which is exactly what he is. Because they ducked away from the conversations that he was having a lot with women yep. about schools and parents and, you know, what we should do for schools, what we should do in schools. And then it seemed on the other side, it, the, the, the conversations weren't even happening. Exactly. I think that's absolutely right. Rachel and Alex were on your podcast a few weeks ago. And one thing you all talked about was the importance of calling things what they are. Lies are lies. Racism is racism. And fascism is fascism. Why is calling things what they are so important? Because if we don't, it, it, allow, it, it allows room for the kinds of misinformation I, I talked about earlier. Mm. First of all, I had such a blast with them. It was great. The thing is that, uh, for example, with critical race theory, because there was no counter, because Yunkin wasn't called racist and his strategy wasn't called racist, he was able to make what uh, was apparently for a lot of people a compelling argument. People were pulling punches. I, I'm not sure why. Yeah. I, it continues to mystify me. If we call things what they are, and we get asked to explain why we're using the word fascism or racism, for exa example, we can explain why. We can educate people to understand um, why it's valid to use those terms, the ways in which uh, the people we're describing fit that description. On the other side, you know, we get called, uh, Republicans call Democrats, socialists, communists, Leninists, Marxists, mm. all the time. Ask them all to the explain what they mean, and they can't. <laughs> but if you ask us to explain racism, fascism, lies, I've got an explanation. That's a good point. All right, so you just mentioned, I mean, so the Virginia race and, you know, what was going on around race and education. How do we push back against it? 
when, you know, the right wing doesn't even acknowledge it exists. Well, I, I think a lot of people on the left don't either. Uh, there's just sort of mm. this assumption that America is not a racist country and that we've solved all of those problems and it's absurd and it's dangerous and it yeah. just because we elected a black president yep. and like that all done all went away yeah and mm -hmm. so explain the backlash to that to me and this is interesting because this is what's happening on the right they're they're passing they're uh passing all this legislation so that people don't need to be subjected to uncomfortable facts by which they mean they don't want to teach american history as it happened because the real history, the real yeah. history, yeah, because, they want propaganda, not real history, right? Because yeah. they don't want white children to feel bad. But nobody's, nobody's saying any of us is responsible for slavery. But we do need to take responsibility for the fact that we benefited from that system. We continue to benefit from that system. We continue to benefit from the fact that this is a racist country. It's just true. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not, I'm not making, trying to make anybody feel bad. I'm a white woman who grew up in the seventies. I benefit from that system enormously. And I continue, we cannot give up our white privilege. The least we can do is acknowledge it. I think that's an important point that you made because you talked about these systems that we've benefited from, but the bit, their biggest worry is you're going to make my white kid feel bad, right? But when you talk about systems, you're not talking about their white kid. You're talking about a system that kid had nothing to do with. Right. So their inherent worry of like making my white kid feel bad is completely erased by the fact that we're talking about systems that have disadvantaged certain people, systems, yep. right? So that's not making your kid feel bad at all. By the way, there's never been any concern about how black children feel. Oh, I think that's such a good point. Before we go, we like to ask a few rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I, I think I am. Would you rather jump 100 years into the past or 100 years into the future? Oh, definitely the future. Oh, definitely. Same. I think same. Who's your favorite news anchor? There are lots of ton really talented people out there. Rachel Maddow, of course, Joy Reid. Nicole Wallace uh, would be at the top of the list for sure. What about your least favorite news anchor, if you're willing to tell us? Chuck Todd. You know, it's ridiculous to mention people on Fox. They're propagandists <laughs> and, and they're, you know, they're it's it's not news. Oh, I like that. So you can take Chuck No, Chuck Todd does an enormous amount of damage. I do not understand why that man has a, that job or any job, quite honestly. So you recently adopted a kitten, which is so cute. So what's been the best thing about having a kitten? Everything. They're the best. I'm a cat person. Kittens. I, I can't explain why they're the, the most adorable creatures <laughs> that exist. Don't tell my kids, please. <laughs> they really want a kitten right now. What's the best movie you've watched recently or streaming show if you'd rather do a streaming show? I, I'll go with streaming. I, I really like Yellow Jackets. <gasps> we just started watching it. Yeah. I got a little nervous. I was like, uh oh, is this going to get gory? So I had to Google. And then I was like, no, it's going to be OK. I was like, all right. It's not out of control, Gory. And it's just so well acted. And it's just such a great premise. We are very into it. And then although we watch it at night, which I don't know if that's the best idea. But when else do we have time to watch it? I exactly. like so I, it, that's the challenge. It's anyway. a nighttime show. So what gives you hope for 2022? I, I constantly remind myself that there are more of us than there are of them. And every day, the other side uh, gives us more and more reasons to be active. We all need to be one industry voters. We're voting for democracy. Mm. So that's so good. Yeah. So the fact that there are so many of us really uh, need, we need to keep that in mind because it's true. That is such a good point. And I think every day they come up with something. So this is the end of our rapid fire questions. Where can people go find out more about you and your work? I recently started a newsletter on Substack called The Good in Us, uh, which I'm really, I'm enjoying tremendously. So I'd love for people to check that out. And I started a podcast called, it's a very original name, The Mary Trump Show um, on Politicon. Uh, so you can get that anywhere on Apple podcast. Uh, and that's also been a blast. Um, I've had some amazing people come on so far and uh, follow me on Twitter at Mary L Trump before you go. So what made you want to write about the good in us? Well, I, there's a huge danger in, in becoming that, which we hate because we're under so mm. much stress. Things have been horrific for four years and unimaginably bad for almost two because of COVID and all of the death and fear and illness, uh, it, it doesn't seem to end. And if we do become them, then we lose anyway. And I think they're trying to use the good in us against us.
and we can't let that happen. We need to hang on to that. We need to have each other's backs and um, we need to, we, we need to remember what matters and why we're fighting and we're not fighting to become like the enemy. We're, we're fighting to make sure that we um, get to a point where we live in a country that actually does treat everybody equally and does care about its citizens and have a government that does work for us because it is us. I love that. So I think about um, that I don't talk to my father for political and you know similar reasons. And I think I got to the point where engaging with him was pulling me to a place that I would lose that good in me. And it's, it wasn't worth it. Yeah. I just want to say something really quickly, because that is so important. People think, oh, it's my family. You know, I, I have to put up with all of it mm -hmm. because it's my family. Well, you know what? That's just permission for people to treat you badly. If somebody's in your family, they should treat you better than they treat yes. everybody else. Yes. And we don't, we don't seem to understand that. Uh, so I think sometimes disengaging, cutting all ties is the healthiest thing you can do. So I'm glad you did that. Thank you. This was so fun, Mary. Thank you again for joining me on the Suburban Women Problem. Thanks, Amanda. I really appreciate being here.